so the new album came out one week ago as of the posting of this video uh so it was monday july 18th that the record came out you know i'm pretty pleased with the response so far certainly people have responded very positively to the music and i think on a broader perspective the internet is responding positively to it um, both from uh, the musical side and from the video component you know the video i think is um in in some ways kind of the the best manifestation of the entire project because you're seeing um you know two levels of creative output three levels technically if you think of it uh you see first the song and the you know the writing the recording the performances that go onto the record um and then you have the comic component of course which i wrote and then my friend claudio Gerardo up in toronto drew and executed and then there's the editing of that comic into the motion comic video the song comic as i like to call these things uh, and that's kind of um, my jurisdiction on that and i edited all these videos as well um, so on all three of those levels I, I i'm pretty proud of the work i think it's really great um, beyond that i thought this is pretty cool too because i got these physical copies and um it's a very limited run of these by the way it's a very limited addition to this um but i think this packaging just came out so beautifully this is a company called atomic disc up in salem oregon and um i like this reusable plastic bag uh, thanks raji reusable plastic bag i like that um, and then the disc itself this is a two disc volume okay because it has both the full record 1920 and then it has the something will come of this single which includes um something will come of this which is on the 1920 record complete and then there's three b-sides on it so i did decide to make this a two disc set which i think is pretty cool come on go away but i think it's pretty cool um nice little insert a lot of gear um, my friend Jager Smith helped me with this and, uh, she did a really amazing job. She's helped out on a lot of my previous records to, um, get the graphic design laid out in a beautiful format. Okay. And, um, I think she really kind of knocked it out of the park this time, not just with the layout, her font selections, uh, the contrasting color right the see-through tray cards and how you know the iconography matches on both sides right uh, a lot of nice details on there you know i thought this just came out just fabulously so she did a really great job with it and then of course the cover art from my good friend scott angle you guys have seen scott's cover work before but just look at that thing it's beautiful you know and um one of the reasons i wanted to be a musician in the first place was because of this type of artifact that you can then create the album the record it is a historic item it's a historic artifact uh, think of what a recording is a recording is a snapshot in time of a particular song as performed by a particular group of people with a particular set of instruments and you can even get more specific it's not just that they played the guitar but they played a specific model of guitar with a certain type of strings in a certain room captured by a certain microphone right all of these things go into making this artifact what it actually is something very special okay and um i've always been attracted to this ever since i was really young that um oh, when i was young i had this very small fisher price record player and it was a kind of shared object that all my brothers and sisters we all took part in it maybe not my oldest brothers and sisters but um, um certainly 
you know, those siblings that were kind of in the same age range as I was. And we had these very cool, very cool storybook records. We had Star Wars on vinyl. Um, in fact, we had the entire uh, original trilogy, episodes four through six, on vinyl record. And it was a narration, so you would open up this object and you would take the 12 inch vinyl and you would put it on this thing it was a toy meant for children okay but you would take this vinyl and put place the needle on it and it would start to play and you guys maybe some of you remember this as the narration would continue you're following along in a book a physical book and then it would toll a bell or on some of the star wars ones uh there would be a chime sound bite of R2-D2's clicks and whirs, robotic voice. And that would be the signal to turn the page. And you would turn it and then the story would continue. And it would go on for not long, 12 to 15 minutes on a large 12 inch vinyl. I did have seven inch versions of Star Wars and Empire as well. And uh, um, not only were these extraordinarily vivid media experiences and it wasn't so much the picture book as it was the narration and the action the music embedded within it that would impact the drama and heighten the excitement of the scene um, but it was also reinforcing how you read you're following along with the narrator and you're, you're as a child following along word for word and you're hearing words being pronounced and then you see the printed word on the page and lo and behold, suddenly you're learning how to read because you're having a physical interaction between the spoken word and the printed word and you're touching it and you're feeling it, right? It's a real object. It's a real object. As I got older and I started collecting my own music, right? Because as a, as a kid growing up, I had the music that people would buy for me, or I had my parents' record collection, which was extraordinarily eclectic, and my grandfather's record collection as well. When I would go visit him, he had an extraordinarily eclectic collection of music, a lot of jazz. Primarily jazz, I think, in his uh, record collection, although he had a ton of John Philip Sousa as well because he was a huge Sousa fanatic. Um, but then, you know, first edition of Sgt. Pepper would be in there. Um, some very hip Ravi Shankar records were in there. I still have those. Um, I have a lot of the Sousa recordings as well. Um, and these were all the things that I then listened to as a kid Okay. And then as I started buying my own music, right, um, I was attracted to the, the visual aesthetic of the album cover. And you all know the feeling, those of you who grew up like this, the same way that I did, is you would get home and you have the record in your hand or the CD even. Because I still did this in high school when records were less en vogue. They're still around, but less um, popular. I did this with cassettes, I did this with CDs. Um, you can't wait to get this thing home and then you carefully unwrap it and you open it up and you take apart every single aspect of this. You lift up all the discs and you read every single word beneath it. And then if you're lucky enough to have something like a lyric sheet, right? Or some sort of liner notes, you just read every single word and you just soaked it up it was bread and butter it was manna right this was paramount to the experience of listening to music was feeling and touching and reading the material it was paramount to the experience Now fast forward to 2022, and this experience is gone. It doesn't exist, except in small, little independent releases like this, from people 
who value this experience to the extent that they would go through the trouble of attempting to recreate it for you and say, check this out, spend some time with me and this. This is what I want to show you. Yeah, the videos, they're all cool. I just told you why they're cool. Don't get me wrong, I love them. I love the work that Claudio did. Don't get me wrong. I love the recording, um, you know, the Spotify streams. Yeah, I can be proud of those things. But this is what I wanted to show you. This. Because I think that if you take the time to get this in your hands and you interact with it on the levels that I just described, you take it from the package, you unearth it from this plastic. It's reusable plastic, by the way, for those of you concerned about that. It's reusable plastic. You could use this same bag again, okay? Which I will. I'll put it right back inside when we're done here. Um, carefully unwrap this. Carefully open it and observe just how beautifully this all got laid out, right? I'm even turning the discs so that they're vertical again. So you get the notion of the aesthetic that I wanted you to experience. I want you to see this. That's a beautiful thing right there. It's a beautiful, beautiful cover. I'm very pleased with it. Pleased with all the cover art from Run Downhill over all these years. Because it was such a huge part of putting out the records for me. And we got together to rehearse last week. Adam Levy, my bass player, comes over and you know he's all over this record. And uh, um, I wanted to give him you know a stack of artist copies so that he could have a couple for his collection and then for anything that he wanted to do, if he wanted to give them away as, you know, gifts or promo, promo, excuse me, or whatever he wanted to do, I wanted to make sure that he had a stack of them. Um, and his comment to me, first he said, oh my God, this is beautiful. And then he said, I'm so glad that you printed copies because I'm always disappointed on all the records that I play on anymore when people don't make a physical copy. They don't make it. And uh, it's always a disappointment because I want to feel it. I want to hold it and feel the weight of it. You even want to smell it. Seriously, the ink that this is printed with has a smell to it that you can instantly associate with records. And for the comic book people of it, you know this without me even having to say it. Because every comic book, when you come home with the stack of your pulls, and you smell the ink on the page. And there's something extraordinarily powerful from that. It's not just that it's nostalgic, harking back to a time long ago that perhaps you long for, right? But it's the notion that this is a real object and that this it, it, it doesn't just exist in the ether. It's grounded, it is tethered to the earth by a real thing and you can connect with that and what's so profound about this is then this becomes a totem of some sort that we attach additional meaning to and I think in my opinion I think this is the problem with music today is it is not grounded in any sense of reality. There's nothing physical that you can point to and say, that's what that is. It's track four on disc one. That's the one that resonates with me. That's gone. That sensibility is gone. Go to Spotify right now. For those of you who use a free account, pull up 1920. It won't let you choose a song to listen to. You have to press play and it will randomly shuffle and decide what song to play for you. You don't have a say in this unless you buy their premium account and then yeah, you can do whatever you want, you know, but how many of you are actually doing that? I don't. I don't use Spotify like this, why would I? 
I'll buy the record. I still have a CD player in my car and I use it exclusively. I do not stream anything in my car. Um, I put this album together with the songs in a specific order and that's the way I'd like you to hear them. But I think too often in the modern music paradigm is that um, there is a notion that we're just going to make this easy for you. Don't think about it. We'll take the thinking part out for you. No problem. We'll think for you. We'll tell you which songs that you should listen to next. It's absolute tomfoolery to think that it's the same experience of music now as when I grew up or as in previous generations. And yeah, you can make the argument that every generation would have the same argument. It was different in the 60s than it was in the 70s or it's different in the 90s than it was in the 60s. Whatever. I think that argument is, first of all, it's an oversimplification because there's but one paradigm shift where all this nonsense was invited in. And that shift occurred when we decided to reject this because it was simpler to hold an extraordinarily expensive digital device, i.e. your smartphone, and then to have a whole bunch of other corporations curate things based on an algorithm and then feed them to you. And you wanted that, didn't you? You wanted that shift. Otherwise, who would have made it? Well, I'm not so sure that we all wanted this. I'm really not. Um, if you haven't heard about this, this is a bit of a tangent, but I think it's relevant. Look up the Uber files. And look and see what this company did. Uber, the rideshare company. Um, and how it was that they got their business model up and off the ground. I said from the beginning that Uber's business practices were illegal. I couldn't necessarily pinpoint why. I just looked at it and said, this is illegal. How are they allowed to get away with all this nonsense? where a traditional taxi cab, cab company could not get away with it. Well, look up the Uber files and you'll find out why. It turns out that it wasn't that we all wanted Uber so much and the consumer demand was in such a high, high degree that governments and local municipalities just decided to forego formal taxation and registration of a livery transportation company and just let the internet go, come what may. Turns out that's not at all what happened. Turns out that heads of state all over the world actually lobbied behind closed doors to allow a company like this to basically bully their way into these markets in various countries all over the world. It wasn't just the United States, it was everywhere or at least it was those countries who participated in the early rollout of Uber, right? And I think there's some additional shenanigans that could be discussed in the midst of this. I'll, I'll hold off on it for now. But um, <laughs> it's worth paying attention to when you start to realize that so many of the modern conveniences that have been delivered to us in the guise of this is new technology, it's brand new stuff, it's going to change the world, um, is a sort of repackaging of something that existed, was perfected in its current model, and was highly, highly effective. But there were ways that you could cut costs and maximize profits by shifting the burden over to the consumer. And if you don't realize that's what's happening when you open up Spotify, 
go try my experiment. Go to Spotify with a free account, not a premium account, a free account. Pull up Run Downhill, try to select the 1920 album, and then see if you can choose a song. Is that the convenience that you sought? It's not the convenience that I sought. I wanted to be able to choose which song I wanted to hear when I wanted to hear it. Certainly I wanted to be able to hear it without advertising. Okay, the last thing that I'll say here is that this is also indicative of my relationship with music, period. I tend to listen to music over and over again, the stuff that I really like. I have records that I bought when I was a teenager that I still go back to. You know, Dark Side of the Moon is timeless music for me. And I listened to that maybe about two weeks ago, as I do with a lot of records that I think are just, they're quintessential parts of my personal life experience. And my opinion is that I don't feel people are really receiving that level of integration of the listening experience via streaming. It's just flights of fancy. I believe that that's intentional. I believe it's intentional. So that you begin to lose further and further connection. And in the process of doing that, more and more meaningless music can be injected into your neurology. So choose wisely. I think that's the theme within all this. Choose wisely what it is that you want. If you want the mundane pre-selected Spotify playlist to tell you what to listen to, by all means do so. If you want a more customized experience, find the artist that you like and resonate with and ask them, say, hey, what's the best way to hear your music? And lo and behold, they'll tell you. They'll tell you. And then listen to them. And if they say, yeah, you could stream it on Spotify and stuff, well, then they've given you permission to do that, haven't they? And I told you, I said, go listen to it on YouTube. See the videos. I want you to see them. They're great. But if you actually want me to continue doing what I'm doing, take a minute and consider your one action of buying a physical copy outweighs the action of 30,000 people who streamed my song once and moved on. It's got that much weight to it. And just think about that for a few minutes. Think about it. That's a good place to stop today. You can get this record at our website, rundownhillmusic.com. Think about it. You're doing us a favor. Okay.